Thanks for your time today. Uh, I've got around about uh, 25 minutes to share with you, uh, probably about 20 years of experience about things why, from a behavioural perspective, things work and don't work. I was thinking on the way here about in such a short time, what can we accomplish? If we look in the world that we live in today, we can accomplish a lot in about 20 to 25 minutes. Uh, what we can do, we can probably get three quarters of a main meal uh, prepared. Um, and if that goes well, we can probably find ourselves winning a competition and actually becoming a chef. <laughs> and I suppose the final thing we can achieve in about 20 or 25 minutes, and this one still kind of uh, spins my wig a bit, I can put a blindfold on, kiss someone who's also got a blindfold on and decide if we're going to get married. Uh, not that I'm thinking a lot of that's going to go on this afternoon, but I suppose we can make some pretty important, uh, some pretty important assumptions and some pretty important learnings in about, uh, in about 25 minutes. So uh, that's kind of my goal today. The uh, blindfolds will be appearing at dinner and uh, you can uh, take your pick from there. So um, I, I want to give you the, be the behavioural aspects of what I've seen work really well and work not so well as far as adopting innovation and also the relationship between an organisation and the change agent. I've seen some stuff that goes incredibly well, um, I can probably cover that off in the period of time, and the majority of it has not gone well. Uh, I'd like to start though with a bit of a quick quiz. So, um, I'd like you to have a think about which is the most important elements uh, for an innovator to have to be successful. Technical skills, uh, industry knowledge, internal sponsorship, fit with the stakeholders of the organisation, operating mandate, previous experience, credentials. So the, the, the lens that I look out of, and um, uh, which, which might not be overly useful at times, sees that this one's the most important. It's, abs it's absolutely the fit. The fit is absolutely most critically important to be able to get my message across, to get engaged. We're seeing that's become increasingly important over the last 20 years. We actually care about to what degree people are engaged. We care about to what degree people fit. The American psychologist Robert Hogan has got a saying, after every social interaction there is an assessment. The dilemma is you and I are never there for our assessment. It's what's said beyond. What are they saying about you? What are they saying about the innovator when they're not there? I've sat in meetings, and I'm sure you people have sat in meetings too, when an opportunity becomes available for a new role and they've got a highly technical skilled person. And recently I sat in one where they said we cannot put that person in the role. There would be anarchy by lunchtime the next day. We would have no one in the team. Great guy, doesn't get the gig. So a few, a few uh, premises I'd like to work with, um, uh, over the, uh, with you here this afternoon. Uh, we're attracted to what we don't have. We're attracted to what's missing. I would say that goes from um, you know, picking life partners right through to organisations. I uh, worked with an organisation that was uh, recently bought by a major bank. And the reason the major bank bought them is because they were nimble, they were quick, uh, they were autonomous, they didn't listen, they were challenging, they were disruptive. Pretty soon after they got, they got uh, bought by the major bank, they whittled away, whittled away, robbed them of all their meaning. And they became just the same. And of course then they got held up and basically said, you guys are not nimble, you guys are not challenging, you guys are not autonomous. Well, you've made us move into your building. We're now on all your systems. We're drinking the Kool-Aid. Perhaps there's an answer there. Uh, second one here, we have a natural tendency to reject anything of threatening difference. The latest research shows us from a values, for personal values perspective, and I see it from culturally, from an organisational value perspective also. I look into the outside world, and if your values are similar to mine, then I actually kind of go, what great people you are. We get along. I love you like a brother. We're born within a five mile radius. We speak shorthand. Of course, the dilemma is I'm only falling in love with a vision of myself. Of course, if I look in the outside world and I find absolute difference, I have a tendency to find the negative in your traits, which reinforce the positive in my own. Uh, the responsibility is on the innovator to adopt, to the, uh, to adopt not the organisation. The organisation is the, is, is the body, it needs the change. And now, if we go back, is there some responsibility from the organisation to actually provide an opportunity? I totally agree. Consistently, I've seen it needs to fall more on the innovator. The innovator cannot adapt, we have a problem. 
the innovator's reputation is the, uh, uh, is the element of highest value. It's what they're saying when the innovator is not there that is absolutely mission critical to the success. Hugely more important nowadays. So I'd like to exemplify the three things that I think make this, uh, make this kind of critical and how best to go about that. So uh, can we spot the innovator there? Great. So the, um, uh, the, the bit that we want, we're attracted, let's go back to, you know, premise number one, we're attracted to the piece we don't have. Very, very often we have organisations or teams or people that are basically kind of going, I'm a process type of person, I need someone that thinks a bit funky, that makes a few crazy decisions. And of course, that's what we absolutely get attracted to. We see the value in that. We see the attraction in that. We see all the positivity in that. If you were going through that stage now, I'd like to stop you and actually kind of go, I get that. But what's the impact of actually having someone like that within your business? Let's just think right now. Are you really up for the journey to actually have a zebra running with the Mustangs? Because it's not all upside. There's also downsides to that. So ideally, this is what we want to see. We want to see a little point of difference, but we want, to see them kind of, uh, we want to see them kind of running with the pack. I would say it's the innovator's responsibility to understand the culture, to understand uh, the mechanisms, to understand how things work from an organisational perspective. I come from another land and I bring a piece of information. It's up to me to interpret that in a way that can be heard. So ideally, this is what we're kind of looking for. We're actually looking that I can have a foot in both worlds. That actually, I get, that I, I, I get where you want to go. I've actually been there. I've been to dry land. But I also get that you're nowhere near that. I have an understanding of that. The innovator that only stands in the, in the zebra world has a problem. And yells back across the cavers, this is what you need to do. The organisation will reject them, eventually. Of course, if they actually... Uh, if they become too much, in, too much like the organisation, then they become part of that. So again, we're looking at this tension between to what degree do I fit and belong, to what degree am I different. Start to get that right, you're pretty attractive, hey? I think it's up to the organisation to provide an opportunity for that. But I think it's up to the innovator to actually execute that. Of course, if we get it wrong, we see something like that. And it's pretty lonely. We then lament about what could have been from an organisational perspective. And welcome to the human race when, of course, we find fault with the person that we brought in or the group that we brought in or the, or the change that we tried to make happen. The honesty and self-effacedness about asking what role did we actually have in either the success or the failure, I think, is mission critical. So at the end of the day, what we're actually looking for, we're looking for the innovator to have a foot in both camps. A foot from where I've been, where I can bring the news, and also a foot into your organisation where I can understand exactly what you're up for. How much chilli can you actually have on the plate before, you actually, before, it's, before it's too hot? Not enough, the dish is not tasty. Too much, not edible. So I suppose what we're looking for an innovator is something like that. That's my first point around, uh, around how to get fit around that. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, the next piece, um, a little bit more theoretical. Anyone familiar with Mark Moore and his, uh, his work about value creation in, uh, in uh, government in America? Worthwhile looking up, really, really thick book. Uh, probably the first half of it's really kind of great. Small words, but great book. So um, Moore's got a model that basically says about earning your right through delivering a value. Now, these are not new words to me, but it's, it's quite fascinating when we've got, a, we've got a simple model. There's someone in the authorising environment. I'm imagining if you're sitting here from an organisation, you're probably in the authorising environment to kind of go, hey, we've worked out, we've only, got, we've only got a right hand, we actually need a left hand to make this thing really sing and dance. So you're actually authorising, making some choices around what you're actually looking for from an innovative perspective. The job of the innovator is that you actually provide permission for the innovator to deliver value. That's what you actually want. So you actually find someone, you go to tender, you, you take a process. Baxter was really great with that. There's actually people in the authorising environment say, we're going to take a risk to actually look at some value, innovation value delivered in our organisation. As a consequence of that, we're going to give someone, some people, some resources, some power to get things done. Otherwise, just sits in the nice to have space. So we're going to give you operational capability, people, money, time, opportunity. As a consequence of that, we want you to produce, we want you to co-produce some value. Making sense so far? 
I don't think Moore was up all night thinking up this model. Uh, so, so really simple, authorising environment, value delivery and operational capability. The tricky bit now becomes within this model is, is that whoever is delivering the value, the value must be delivered back to the authorising environment. Quite simple, quite easy. I would say for anyone here who's an innovator is that your job is to actually deliver back not the value that you like, not the value that you think, not the value you want, the value that's actually decided by the authorising environment. So who's in the authorising environment and how good are you at actually, at actually packaging your value back there? I've seen lots of great initiatives that are splitting the atom over the, over the, uh, over on uh, the, uh, left, uh, the right, left hand side in your guys' case around value. Just absolutely amazing. The moment that they actually lose and not delivering back to the, uh, not delivering back to the authorising environment, there is a major problem. Because this becomes cyclical, doesn't it? So you guys, you guys bring me in, you fall in love with me, you love me to death, I deliver some value, you actually kind of go, wow, what a great guy Warren is. Might have to find a bit more money, let's chop a bit off the Christmas party, let's give it to Warren, let's give him some more people, let's give him some more scope, extend his contract. Wow, what an amazing job he's doing. I'll tell you what, let's get rid of some of these over here and give those resources to Warren. And on it goes. Of course, the irony is if it goes left, it goes right too, doesn't it? So you engage Warren in, look great at the start, doesn't hit the mark, what the hell's he doing? Not really sure. It starts to go the other way. You'll start to take away some operational capability. How long is that contract for? How can we speed that up? Okay. Let's start taking some time, some scope away from him. If I'm in-house in an organisation, what I actually do is actually start to reduce my, start to reduce my, um, uh, reduce my exposure, you're going to take my people away, and pretty soon I'm out of a job. The job, if you're the innovator, is you've got to deliver value that, are, that is through the eyes of the authorising environment. It's not up to your job to decide the value. Second point. Third point is, is that um, uh, looking at derailment under stress and pressure, how are you likely to shoot yourself in the foot? How are you likely to actually ruin your reputation? Four simple ways, um, too introverted, too extroverted, too compliant, too diligent. Some of these are kind of nice, some of these are actually valued, too introverted, too excitable, too passionate, too volatile, too sceptical, finding fault with others' ideas, too reserved, just going to do my own thing, enough about the organisation, they've employed me, I'm just going to operate, I'm operate separately, too cautious, not challenging enough. So they're, they're humanistic traits that under stress and pressure uh, we, we have a tendency to go to. Too extroverted, too bold, I'm spending too much time talking about how lucky you are to have me, and by the way, I can boil the ocean. Too colourful, too dramatic, too much look at me. You know, we see great examples of, you know, we see great examples of this um, you know, you know, you know, corporately. So I'm, I'm not actually spending enough time in the business because I'm off doing interviews and blogs and speaking at things like this. Too much attention seeking for me. Too imaginative, my ideas are just too crazy. Have you ever thought of being the first to open on the moon? Wouldn't that be great? No one's done it before. You guys should take the space. Too perfectionistic, I'm going to do it all myself, and too compliant, I'm just going to be so nice and agreeable just to get along. They're the challenges around that under our, yeah, under our human nature that we're actually like to derail our reputation, to impact the information you get. There will be a point where you get sick of me and stop listening. I could have the lotto numbers and you're not going to be able to hear me in these states. So again, both from an organisational perspective and from an innovative perspective, these are absolutely critical to ensure that your reputation is intact. At the end of all, and summing up, it's as simple as that. When I'm not here, am I going to get a red one or a green one? That's the whole comment around things like that. At the end of the day, it will, it will not only be about what, what technical skills I bring, it will be about my ability to fit, my ability to connect, how much you believe me, how much I understand, and what value I produce. Uh, final thing for you guys. Um, I spoke to Alan about this. Uh, I've written a book about how things fit, researched over 3,000 um, 3, uh, people about what works and doesn't work. There's a free chapter available for you if you'd actually like to, uh, actually like to take that down. Thanks for the opportunity to speak with you guys today. I hope that um, um, perhaps not quite as defining as kissing someone with a, uh, with a blindfold on or getting your own restaurant, but potentially something that may actually make you consider from an innovative perspective.